Good morning, Magic. I'm Gavin Verhey from Wizards of the Coast. And today I have an extremely special episode for you. I am so excited to have a true luminary of Magic's art world to talk with you today about a piece that he did in Strixhaven. Welcome to the show, Jesper Ising. Hi, Gavin. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Jesper, you've been doing magic art for a very long time. What was your first set? The first set was Lorwyn. I, um, I really enjoyed that set. Uh, I tried to become a magic artist for a very, very long time before Lorwyn. But then, all of a sudden, uh, they needed um, a European fairy tale vibe for a set. And uh, since I'm Danish and live in Denmark, it's a pretty close to a fairy tale landscape and fairy tale art, the stuff I do. So I, uh, I was, that was finally the set where I, I could use my, my style. So um, Lowen, Lowen was, was <laughs> my, my chance and I really, really loved that set. I was also a huge Lorwyn fan playing during that time. And uh, I think even now your pieces still have a bit of that Lorwyn-esque quality in them, which we'll get to in a little bit. But so we picked you up with Lorwyn, but I'm sure you've been doing art for much longer. So give me a quick background on yourself. I went to university and I thought I was going to be a literature, uh, art history or literature major. But then yeah, when I was around 21, I got a, a, a job as a colorist for a comic book and then I did, just didn't look back. To my father's regret, that was more or less uh, how I skipped university and started uh, becoming an artist. <laughs> and so you, start, you started Magic uh, with Lorwyn. Did you play Magic before then? Or was, was kind of Lorwyn your first exposure to Magic? No, I was always a fantasy geek in every aspect of fantasy. And uh, at a convention in 93 in a gaming convention, role-playing game convention, I saw some people playing this card game with monsters on it. And I remember I looked at the drawings and thought, hey, they, they look nice. Uh, maybe I should try and, and get into that stuff. I kind of forgot about it until the same convention a year later, where a lot of people were playing this card game. And then I started buying the boosters. We went down to buy the boosters and uh, we, we found out that these boosters with the little shimitar on the bottom, they were quite nice. So we asked the bookstore, hey, uh, where's the box with the shimitar boosters? We want some more of those. And they said, no, oh, that's not anymore. I said, when will they be back? They will not be back. And then we were like, oh, we made a mistake. And we should have bought everything. And then we, we just bought everything they had of antiquities. And I just, I didn't stop since then. I know when it comes to formats, you play a decent amount of Commander. What are some of your, of your favorite Commander decks to play right now? Uh, right now, I just built a Timna Malcolm deck that I really enjoy. Uh, I like the fast pace of it. I like the, the card draw and the, the mana ramp ability of it, even though it's not green. Um, but my all-time favorite deck is on that of the Royal. I've never played against him, but I'm terrified already. So speaking speaking of Commander Jesper, the, to get into the meat of today's show, you did something really cool for Strixhaven. For the Commander decks, for the C21 Commander decks, you did one of the base commanders right here. And I'm super excited to be able to talk to you about the creation of this character, right? I mean, to read that art description out there for everyone, everyone watching, I think it's pretty interesting to both hear this, what Jesper was sent, and then also what he came back with here for Willow Dusk. So uh, the art description is as follows. Setting, Strixhaven. Color, black and green creature. Location, outdoors in a Witherbloom environment. Specific location, not important. Action, show an ancient female dryad. See page 86, especially the aged looking A on that page. With a hunched form and long willow branches hanging down from her head. She is a Witherbloom professor and her costume might incorporate veils and lanterns like we see on page 82E. Maybe both are hanging in the branches of her head. Focus, the witchy old dryad. Mood, ancient and wise and somewhat spooky, but her class will expand your horizons. What did you think when you got this assignment to come across your desk? First of all, I love assignments like this where I get to do a portrait of a figure. I mean, I can, that way I can add a little bit of myself into the, to the, the painting and, when I got the art description, there was a lot uh, hinted 
I mean, I don't know. Maybe I have a, a maybe it's good that I'm a magic player because there was a stuff in the art description that hinted at at control and not necessarily evilness, but then uh, deep dark secrets and stuff like that. So I, I when I looked through the style guide, I thought, okay, well, how can I show that she has this immense power, maybe power over life and death? And as soon as I saw the little the little creatures called pests, I thought, ah, this is the key. This is, she should be somehow playing with life and death around these small pests. And I came up with the idea, maybe she's dragging life force out of the little pests. Uh, not necessarily to be evil, but to, to show the students how you can, you can draw life from living creatures. <laughs> not evil, not evil, just, just, just death. If you look at uh, the, the sketches I made, I made a lot of sketches for this. She has like a, like a thoughtful look to her and she's looking down in this bubble of plasma where we have a little pest lying around. I thought that she looked too, what do you say, royal? or too nice looking or too profound. So I made a second one where she looks more witchy. That's number two. And she has like this, she has long pointy fingers and there was still something I didn't like. She was too witchy and not too dryad like. And I didn't like how the, there wasn't any depth to the painting and there wasn't any interaction with the viewer. And I really liked that. So I made the number the one I call number four here. And I thought that was too human, maybe. I mean, she was supposed to be a dryad and all that. So I ended up with the one called number three. And the reason why, uh, there was something I wasn't too quite happy with. Um, you can see she's holding one of the pests and she has like a little egg in her finger, between her finger. My original idea was she was like pulling this egg out of the pest, but there's something a little too gory about that. So. I couldn't make like slime threads, like she's pulling egg out of her. That's too too much maybe, right? So she, now she's just holding it like she, I have the secret of his life here and I'm gonna eat it, something like that. I even got this sketch approved and I was ready to paint it. I thought that ah, it's not clear enough what she's actually doing. Is she holding a little pearl or whatever? And that kind of annoys me when, when I feel that I'm not clear enough that I didn't show the narrative well enough. So I actually, right before I started painting, I scrapped it all and started all over. <laughs> I, uh, one night at home, I did a little bit of, little sketch uh, that had the mood that I kind of wanted where she's somewhere between evil and profound. And I ended up sending that to the art director video and asking, is it okay I give it another step? Because I think I can do better than the one you already approved of. And luckily he said, yes. All right, so you have your direction kind of figured out here now. You know, you've got some, a nice sketch, but how do you take it from that sketch all the way through to the final? Like, where do you even start with that? What are you doing there, Jesper? The first, the most, absolute most important thing for me is to add a little narrative and to come up with that narrative. And as, as soon as I get that, I, everything else falls in place. And uh, with, with her, as soon as I got the, the, the branches, horns coming out towards us and the gaze she has where she's looking underneath her brow and uh, the sketch is very rough, I think, but it still had everything I had in my mind. And, um, and as soon as, uh, uh, when a video okayed that, I, I just go directly to my board and start drawing it, drawing it out. And the way I do that is I try to be more detailed than my sketch. I add all the details, all the small trinkets and all the stuff that I know will add life to the painting. And then I just start painting. But there's one detail is I paint in acrylic. So it's a somewhat fast medium. So um, you have to work pretty fast. and. For me to be able to do that and make it look spontaneous, I mask out the figure with a kind of film or like a, it's called frisket film. And then I can work easily on the background and I can, I can make big wide strokes and it all look, look carefree, even though it's not. Um, one little detail that I like in this painting is the, the whole painting is more or less centered around this little uh, pest lava kid 
she's uh, hovering over her hands and the way that it glows. And uh, I didn't anticipate it looking like this because I had the masking film on the little creature. And before I pulled the masking off, I just added the orange color in the dark just to make sure that I had a color to paint light into, like a color transition. And then when I peeled off the film to my masking, I noticed, hey, it works. It looks like it's glowing. How did I do that? <laughs> it was completely luck that it turned out the way it did. I would never have, with my intellectual mind, have come up with this. But uh, in, a, in a spur of luck, it just looked like it was glowing tremendously. And I went with that and enhanced it. So I think the, the main part of this painting is just badass luck. Well, maybe a little bit of luck. I'd say there's a lot of skill in there too. <laughs> I, I could, no matter how lucky I got, I'm not drawing this. I'll tell you, tell you that much, Jasper. I try to go with details that I find, especially you see the, the, the way her hair almost mix into becoming a, a cape that is made of willow branches. I went out uh, on, a, on a trip and I found some hanging willows and took a photo of them and, and used that for inspiration for the cloak. Whatever I do in the painting is centered around her gaze at you and, uh, and the little magic beetle or the little magic pest. So everything is more or less derived from that focal point. And if you see, if you look at the final painting, you see how everything in the painting is more or less pointing inwards, pointing centered around this main focal point that is the face and the little, the little thing. I think it's so incredible because that's the kind of thing that you would not necessarily notice consciously. Right, but as an artist, you're thinking a lot about how people will perceive your art and kind of the subconscious behind it. And by making yeah. that focal point there at the center and pulling people's attention in toward it, it really brings in a bit of life and character into the entire yeah. piece. In my mind, I have this idea that the painting should be a, a surface of water and I drop a little pebble in the focal, the main area and the, the pebble make rings in the water. And for each ring, I take away a little something, I take a little bit of contrast, a little bit of detail, I make it darker so that in the end, out in the sides, the rings are just like almost dull and doesn't matter. But it's what what is in focus that becomes better when the rest is not. You know, you said you, of course, spent a long time on this piece. How long do you think this piece or a piece in general would take for you to do? All my paintings take three days. Wow. More or less. And it's a matter of how detailed I can get, and then I my eyes can't focus any any smaller. So it, it takes me three days, and only one and a half of those days are actually painting. The rest is more preparation and sketching and and making things ready, making a color test on a, another piece of paper and stuff like that. The painting is all traditional, uh, but I work digitally also on other jobs. And if I make like when we do concept art for magic, it's digital because that needs a lot of changes. But I always had the feeling that with magic, I wanted it to be a traditional media. So I end up with a final product that is mine. I like that. There's an enjoyment in mixing paint and, and working with real brushes. And I, I need to, I want the process to be the most important thing. And, and traditionally is the one I learned from the beginning. So that's just my comfort zone. So how much reference material do you use for this? I mean, I know you mentioned like taking a picture of some bushes out in the woods, but do you use a lot of reference for this or do you kind of, you know, figure it out all yourself? What's your process like? I, I, I do use reference, but I often use myself as much as I can. So I have a, in front of me at my desk, I have a mirror and that way I can, I can act out all the small little things like, like her gaze. I can, uh, I can look in my mirror and I can see what works and how the eye wrinkles. And I always get in character. So I always hunch like the character. I always try and figure out the facial expression because if I can do it, then I know the feeling that I, that I try to add to my character. So there's a lot of hunching and even a lot of sounds. So I, I sit there in the mirror and go like, <laughs> And, and that helps me understand what the character, how the look should be, how a gaze should be and how the hand gesture should be, all that stuff. 
sometimes I'm in a studio. I'm in a studio with a lot of other artists, and sometimes they're just like, "What are you doing? Yes, why are you grinning?" I'm like, "Hey, I'm I'm in character." <laughs> of course, I could use reference, but I would rather have it be my style, something I make up, so it looks more like a Jesper Ising painting. Well, I have to say, I think you were very successful. This is like the spitting image of you right here. So it looks just looks just like you, you know, very very much so. <laughs> Thanks. No. <I> guess. <laughs> If there is someone out there, Jesper, who is working on art and they're an aspirational magic artist and they want to someday do art for magic or you know some other wonderful game, is there any advice you would give them? Any any wonderful parting words? Yeah, I think I mean uh, if you can take something away from my process in this painting, it is that you should constantly ask yourself critical questions. Is there a way that this image I'm working on could be better or could be? more enticing or that I could drag the viewer more into my world. And uh, clearly it worked that I scrapped all the work I've done and started all over because uh, asking yourself those questions, what can I do to make this painting perfection, makes you search for these small, better narrative and makes you grow as an artist in every single painting. And so I think asking qu critical questions to yourself during the process is my my main main uh, goal when I paint. And I think that's a good advice. Very good, Jesper. This has been, once again, absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. And everyone out there, please check out the comments down below. If you have any uh, thoughts or anything you want to share, me and Jesper will be reading them. And uh, once again, thanks Jesper so much for his time here today. I will talk with you all again very, very soon. And in the meantime, may you have a lot of fun playing with Willow Dusk. You got this. But we thought we could do something even better. And that's instead of making a third legend, which is being kind of stretched thin to make happen, we could really focus on making cool monocolor legends for each of the two colors in this product. So for example, in Commander 2019, you got one additional bonus legend per deck. Well, this time around, you get two additional bonus legends per deck.